Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Move Podcast, talking about Perry Roubaix, a.k.a. the Hell of the North. I'm joined down there in Austin, Texas, by J.B. Hager, who, J.B., yeah. you, were, you were joined, apparently, this morning by the head of HR. Mm-hmm. That was a, that was a nice surprise. She's in town. And, yeah, so uh, and was staying like a mile from my house. Yeah. Yeah, she's giving up on us up here in Aspen. <laughs> also joined by George Hincapi down there. And uh, we don't really know. We, he's got multiple houses. He's got, uh, we, we believe that he is not in his uh, primary residence, um, but somewhere in, in, the, you know, in the sticks of uh, shoot down the balloon, South Carolina. <laughs> uh, George, just real quick, it, you, do, you do realize this is sort of a PG or PG-13 show. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but off your right shoulder, that that's this is not, you know, Pornhub or anything of the ilk. Uh, just have a look. Look over your right shoulder. I I got it. What is yeah, it? I can I can always move. I feel, like you, might wanna, I feel like you might want to just angle it. There are children watching, so just angle it just a little. It's a little sculpture that I have in this room, but yeah, okay, I got gotcha. you. Well, hang on. Let's talk amongst the group. Actually, should we just move it back? It might be better moving it back. I say move it back. Okay, good. Back, uh, yeah. For those just listening to the show, George has got, uh, um, it's, you know, it's, it's porn-ish. It's, uh, it's art. It's art. It is. So it is. Uh, and over there in Madrid, Johan Bruniel, our sensei, the man that knows it all, and the man who was up much earlier than any of us. Um, uh, I guess high level, what, a, you know, what a magnificent, it was an interesting race. I thought it was a really dynamic race. A lot of stuff happened, but Matthew Vanderpool, uh, exceptional performance. His team, Alpeson, which we talked about a few weeks ago, we was sort of looking around going, where are these guys? Uh, well, they got first and second today. So I, I think they, they got the wake up call. Um, but exciting race. We'll get all into it here in a second. Today's show brought to you by Element. We talk about it all the time. You know, when I go out and we're finally getting to that time of year, it's going to be 60 degrees this week here in Aspen. I will actually go outside and ride my bike and sweat. Element will be my hydration go-to source. 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium, no sugar, no gluten, no artificial ingredients, no BS. Special offer for our listeners. If you go on over to drinklmnt.com slash the move, you get the free sample pack that's got... Uh, one pack of every flavor. So citrus, raspberry, orange, and unflavored. And it's perfect for you guys that just want to kind of dial in the, the flavor you like. Again, it is our go-to source, uh, and it is warming up. Spring is here. Summer's right around the corner. Folks, it is time to sweat. It's try- time to drink Element. Again, drinklmnt.com slash the move. Your free gift with purchase. Also today, and I love this, they are back. Today's show brought to you by George's Favorite, Manscaped. So go ahead and tell the world the leaders in below the waist grooming are traveling north of your South Pole <laughs> with their revolutionary grooming products, the brand new Weed Whacker 2.0, and their new beard line confirms they have all the best tools for your hygiene toolbox. Time for you to upgrade your game by going to manscaped.com and using our code, the move, for 20% off plus free shipping. Now, I just want to touch on this for a second because I'm looking at you, George, <clears throat> and I don't grow a beard like you. I mean, I'm trying. You see this. Like, I, I, I'm not quite in the, in, the, in the space of really needing, uh, like you, the Weed Whacker 2.0 or the beard line. Uh, line. Uh, but look at you. Look at that beard. Is that just perfect or what? Well, the, uh, yeah, the, the beard, what do we call it? The beard whacker or <laughs> the beard whacker? <laughs> Uh, it's very, you know, it's a very important part of my routine. Um, you know, I'd like to, I take pride in having a nice, even beard. Um, so yeah, I love that new product. I brought it to Belgium with let me, me. Let me, let me go out on a limb here. Does, and this is, and, and I know we're talking about Manscaped, but this is, this is just, we got to talk about it. And this is also fun to talk about. And it's a question, George, I'm going to put you on the spot. Cause I know you love talking about Manscaped so much. We're still, we've still got this George Manscaped challenge out there to get you to uh, shave up behind one of those silhouettes. <laughs> Um, here's a real, is a serious question because, uh, uh, does, what do you, you keep trying to put that know, more no, no, into no. the picture. This is, no, I'm good. No, I was good. what are you going to, we going to pan down and see what else we got. Um, <laughs> Something. why don't you pan down to the South pole as, as manscaped <laughs> says, but here's the question. Does, does, does Melanie borrow your manscaped? <laughs> no, absolutely not. But Enzo does now. 
<laughs> okay, good. <laughs> good. Oh, God. Again. But to go back to uh, Element T and Manscaped, those are products that we both were just, uh, we used in uh, Flanders, which we were out there last yeah. weekend. And uh, Element T, I, I got to touch upon it. It's an awesome travel drink as well. As you know, you travel overseas or when you're traveling, generally you're always dehydrated. That is my go-to source for yep. uh, hydration, especially on planes and, and working out. And as a reminder, you get 20% off plus free shipping if you head on over to manscaped.com and use the code THE MOVE. All right, let's talk about Perry Rebay. Um, Johan, I'll go to you just because you, you, again, you were up the earliest. You saw, you, you know, I don't know if you saw the race from the very beginning. It seems like you did based on our conversation earlier. But um, I, just to kick it off, fastest Perry Rebay in, in history followed up by uh, just a week after the fastest Tour of Flanders in history. We talk about it all the time how fast these guys and gals are and the, this, these Pelotons are. Um, clock don't lie. Uh, so w- w- high-level thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it's, it's consistent with what we're seeing the last few years. You know, the level goes up and up and up. I think you can also see you have the, the at the finish, you have these the groups of the big favorites and then this big, big group basically a bunch print for 12th or 13th place or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, once again, same scenario more or less as, as Flanders, you know, it took 80 kilometers before the breakaway could go, a small breakaway. So we knew from that, from that part on that that breakaway was not going to be a factor in the race. Sometimes it is. Sometimes some riders um, have, you know, make it, to the, make it to the final. This time we, we knew it was not going to be the case. I think they had a maximum of two minutes or something. Um, and then I was really, you know, since there were so many riders together, uh, the first sector, and you know this, George, more than anybody else, you know, that first sector is just a war. Um, and what we saw there, um, we could see the big fate made the, I mean, Van der Poel and Van Aert, the two big favorites, getting through with their teams, but really, uh, some really bad crashes in front of the peloton, like, like close, close to the front. And we could see already some guys got eliminated basically on the first sector. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was just basically, and they were, they were sliding out. They just, the tires were not um, holding to the tarmac and it was just sort of weird crashes. You see these crashes before these really stressful sections all the time, but where riders are just sliding out, simply sliding out the best riders in the entire world that technically shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. Well, I think today the the mud was probably a factor also, George, you know, it was obviously Luckily, it was dry, but there was some mud, uh, a lot less than than yesterday for the women's race, but there was still some mud. And then when you get off the sectors and that sticking mud is still on the tires, um, I guess that that you're talking about that crash uh, of the Ineos guys in front of the peloton. Yeah, the Ineos guys and the uh, Francais de Joux guy was, no, uh, um, I, forget the, I forget the name of the team, but he, there was another road rider on the Australian team that was uh, coming back. He slid out. Yeah, um, but like we mentioned before in the pre pre show uh, meeting, was for me in these these types of conditions, whether it's dry, of course it's it's a, a bit more stable. But those wet patches, then it becomes super unpredictable. It's almost better right. to be it's pouring rain and super muddy than to what it was today and yesterday for the women, for that matter, where it's dry. But then you have these patches of mud where you don't know when they're coming, and if you hit them the wrong way, you are going down. There's nothing you can do about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, when it's, yeah, it's, it's with, with the rain, you know what you're going to get. You're just, you're constantly paying attention. Do, uh, yeah. do some of those sections where there's standing water, does it get like real, like mossy, slippy, like a low water crossing? Absolutely. You know, it, yeah. You know, it's, it's not it's, just mud, right? No, it's super, super slick. And I, and, and, and that played into a lot, I think that played into a lot of the tactics today where we talked about in Flanders where sort of the, the guys just below the favorites, they're going to try to get a head start. Well, today the favorites didn't even let them do that. They went with a hundred kilometers to go, um, and they went hard, and they caught everybody off guard. I, even myself, I was talking to you guys. I've never seen, or I don't remember ever seeing the favorites going right before the Ehrenberg Forest. Why? Because before the Ehrenberg Forest, the peloton goes sixty k an hour to enter that forest. So if you're yeah, but, that, you're but but the peloton was peloton wasn't that big, right? Yeah, so, it wasn't that big. But still, I've I've been there in many size pelotons you're hauling ass to get to the front of that. But these guys, they don't care. They have no fear. And also, they want to also, eliminate the the risk of crashing. They just go. Right. Exa- exactly. And I think, that, and, and and I heard Laporte after the finish, you know, and he said it was their plan to go on the stretch before Arenberg. Oh, wow. Um, 
So uh, it was Van Aert and Laporte, Van der Poel and, and Degenkolb, and then a few others came back, like six or seven other guys. But if you look, I mean, they, they went from there on, they went full gas to, uh, to Arenberg and they, they were not that, the peloton was not that far behind, you know, in Arenberg. But they, they really wanted to come in first to eliminate the risks. Well, and let's, the, let's, not, let's not forget, Ben Aert uh, flatted right before that section. I mean, he bridged up maybe a few K before. Yeah. To me, it's just the amount of effort that it takes to come back uh, right before these hard sections where the peloton is moving so quick is it's a tremendous effort. Well, I, I want to stick with the plan. Yeah. And we will talk about Van Art and the flats and, and the flats of his team. I, j I just wanted to highlight one thing. I've never ridden, and I'll just say, and you guys know this, but I've never ridden the, the, the force of Ehrenberg. And, and, but just watching it, so like most people listening or watching the show have not ridden it. Um, but just watching it, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I, I'm good, man. I don't, I don't need <laughs> to ride that thing. And if I did have to ride it, I'd have made the same move. Like, get me out of here. Get me away from other people. Like, I'd like to live my life anyways. And and just, just chill. Like, let's just try to get through. The thing is, it would be fascinating, actually. That'd be a fun week. So, let's just take so, take uh, L.A. over there and just get his tank rocked on. Uh, <laughs> well, well, next, apparently, yeah. apparently, you're going, next, L.A. You're going next, next year. Next year. Isn't well, that, yeah, that's, it's, a, that's it's, a channel on XM, isn't it? Taint rock. Taint rock. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh yeah, uh, that's a separate show. But um, so I, I I'm glad you guys brought that up because you you uh, assume that I'm going next year. I did not know that. I, I I will just highlight two things, which one we failed to mention, or I failed to mention. Happy Easter, everybody. <laughs> number one, Easter. Number number two. What a what a great day for sports, right? You've got arguably the most iconic one day bike race in the world, Perry Rebay, and you have the final day of the Masters. I had the setup this morning, right? I had the big screen uh, with 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 the Masters on, and I had the iPad with Rubey on, and so the, all that brings me to this point. Like I, I have committed to going back with you to the Tour of Flanders, which is of course the week before uh, the Masters. I highly doubt I will be riding the Force of Ehrenberg on the final day of the Masters. I pro I just don't see it happening. <laughs> no, the, the, the Lance, it's no, 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 no. The, the ride. Okay, so here's here's how it works. So we have. This this year we had this event at Flanders. We've decided we're going to do it again next year. Yep. I'll be buying it with Roubaix. So two events, right? And the 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 day you're going to be riding is the day before. So that's yesterday. I understand, <laughs> but but that the, the master but the Masters is four days, and in fact, it's it's actually a whole lead up. It's called Masters Week. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and, they don't and, they don't have I, they don't have TVs in Belgium. Let me, let me tell you something. If you can stream, <laughs> if you can, here's the deal, and we're getting we're getting offline here a little bit, folks. Just bear with us. Um, but if you can somehow stream Jim Nance to me on my device while I'm in France, I will do it. Otherwise, I will be at home on my ass watching we, I, Masters. Lance, I think George and I both we have texts. We're going to send screenshots. We have text you confirming you were going to be there. Yeah. So you, it, we have it in writing, both. <laughs> hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, the other thing that that's, uh, stood out, and, and I, and I want to, uh, there's sort of two parts to this, and we have been talking about this, is, is just, the, just the, the disappointment or disappearance of Quick Step. It, it's, uh, it will, you know, they have won races this year, but the, these are the races that Patrick Lefebvre and that team lives for, right? So that's really, my, I mean, what would you say, Johan? The first quick step rider today was 23rd. So you have a team, Alpeson, that gets first and second. Mm -hmm. Quick step, who this is their bread and butter. Top rider, 23rd it place. Was. It was. I was. Think, but yeah, I think but we, yeah. And, and, and the second part I was going to say, and we will start to see this as the season plays out, this is truly now Remco of Enipol's team. It has to be. The, the, yeah. the, the, if, if, if he wants to run two programs, a Remco program and a Classics program, I think at this point, Patrick Lefebvre is going to have to go back to the drawing board because something's, either the riders are getting older or something's not right or something internal. Of course, we know how that goes. Um, but this team is not fired. No, especially in those races. So I, I, I like we've said it again already in, in in other shows. You know, it's the team is changing identity, and their big star is Remco. Well, let's 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 listen. Let's not judge them. Let's wait until he has Baston Liège. Yeah? So we have Amstel, Flesh, and Liège. That's the other part of their team. Obviously, 
this is their terrain, what we had now. Uh, last year was the same thing, but then Remco won Liege Baston Liege in, in an unbelievable fashion, and all of a sudden their spring campaign was okay. So I think, I, I think I, I, I'm fine to pause the 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 conversation or or the, um, the debate, but uh, I, okay, that's fine. I, I think Lefebvre, I think the Cobble Classics, I think that's different for him. Yeah, I, th- I think you know if if he. You know, at Christmas, if he had his Christmas wish, it, it's a cobbled one and not a and and not a Liège or a Flesh yeah. or an Amstel Gold. That's the, yeah. that's just what he he was raised on and what he really sort of loves. So I I agree. It's it's in the DNA of that team. Um, yeah. How many times, Johan, did we go up against them where they had two, three, four guys in a final gr- group of ten, and you have no you have no options to play with? Yeah, those actually, are there was there was one dominant year. team in the history of our of at least our history of the sport. One year, George, you were you were in Paris d'Aubert in the final, and there was four. Uh, what was it, Domo back then, or Domo Farm Fritz, or yes, Domo Farm Fritz. Anyway, it was not a matter of who, if they were going to win; it was a matter with who they were going to win. That was the only question: who was going to win of that team, right? And it was well, I think it was Canavan who won finally. Canavan. Well, it was a question of who I let go to win because they were all attacking me. But just to go back to similarities to this year is. So much has to do with mechanicals and what happens with your, like, for instance, Laporte flatting in, uh, at the Ehrenberg, huge dy- dynamic shift for the ring because now he's gone. He was all, obviously on a very, very strong day. Um, he's gone. Uh, Van Art flatting before, before the Ehrenberg. And then again, at the finish, right when he was going away with Vanderpool, they were gone. There was no way those guys would come back. They were going to the finish together. And to me, I felt like he was a bit stronger than than uh, Vanderpool. He was going with every move, no problem. He was able to save energy because his teammates were coming from behind. I don't know. I think. He, can, I, can, I, can I can I jump? Let me before you know, I know you know yeah. before you say that. But let me just add one other tidbit about flats and that team because as Laporte did flat and got a, a I believe a bike change and was coming back was joined by Van Hoydunk. They were coming back and then Van Hoydunk flatted. So mm-hmm. those three really, I guess we're talking about now four flats. Really, that really changed the the dynamic of the race. Yeah, George, to 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 talk about Van der Poel and Van Aert, you know, you could say okay, they were equal. Um, I personally, you know, looking in hindsight, I, I think Van der Poel, okay, he was obviously very fortunate that he didn't have the problem in the final, and and his main rival did. But I I, I think it, he was a bit stronger than Van Aert. Van Aert knew that he was the guy to mark, so he was every sector, every single sector he started on the wheel of, of Van der Poel. Van der Poel did three, four really big attacks. And then when finally Van Aert attacks, when Van der Poel had that incident with, uh, with Degenkolb, Va- Van der Poel came from a little bit behind. And the way he came back showed me that he was still not finished. You know, and, and I was, during the race, I was a bit worried that Van der Poel was doing too much as usual when he's on a great day. Um, but, then the question is, okay, if they go together to the finish, who's going to win? I mean, nobody knows that, right? Uh, they've, they've been in that situation already before. But obviously that's part of paris Bay. I think the, the best guy won, the strongest guy won. Uh, he had the strongest team. He was always in control with his team. And, um, and he, had, well, look, he, had, he had luck on his side. He really yeah. did. I mean, he didn't, they didn't have the, the well, I guess Philipson did have a, a, a flat, but came back very quickly. Um, he, he did... Uh, Vanderpool did not have any uh, flats. He did say he finished on a spare bike, so that must have been from earlier. Look, even even with 10K to go, you guys see that corner where he missed that barrier by by the smallest of margins. I mean, that ruins a race right there. That's, you know, of course, he can ride himself out of anything, but he, he just sort of floated through the race. There was this one incident that I, I texted you guys about when that 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 left-hand corner, he kind of went on the, on the side, like it was on the banking, yeah. It was unbelievable. I mean, what is it that this guy cannot do on a bicycle? You know. Well, yeah, but I was wondering is that is the they were a different kind of barrier. This is not the barrier. If people didn't see it, this is not the kind of cage barrier with the legs that we always see. They put these plastic, big plastic orange, I mean yellow pylons to keep them on the pave. I thought that was actually very cool. Is that a new thing? But I don't really. That's, that's that. ju- also just in certain sections, JB. Like if you oh. remember, like Ehrenberg. You know, you have the fences like you would at the finish. Those little almost look like blocks of of just in the you know they're just they're large pieces of plastic. They fill with water that end up being really heavy. Um, that, that I don't I don't I don't, I don't sides. 
I don't remember seeing them on that section. Uh, we do remember Lampard crashing last year, which he, he was going for second place. So perhaps that's why they put him just to keep him away from the sides of the roads there where all the spectators are. But going back to that move when Vanderpool took the corner, I believe that these guys know each other so well and they know that if both are on a great day, it's almost impossible to drop each other. So what are they going to do? They're going to, in the recon, they're going to look for these little corners, these little S turns, these little muddy sections where perhaps they can make a little difference, not only make a little difference, but make their rival make a mistake. So I think that's where Vanderpool cl clearly planned that corner and thought, okay, yeah. they're going to try to follow me here, not think about the banking and maybe crash or get yeah. stuck in another crash. I don't think he's guessing. I don't think he yeah. just comes out of the, the backside of a corner and says, uh oh, I overcooked it. I got to send it in the I don't think that's a guess. I think that's things like that they have gone back or, you know, all, either know through experience or saw in the pre rides. Like that's too, that would be too risky to, if, if, I mean, if you overcook it, you got to go where you go yeah. and, and try to figure it out. But he doesn't do that very often. <clears throat> um, that's a high level of recon you're talking about. I mean, that's, they have no choice these days. I mean, they're so, wow. so good and so close. And also, also, George, you know, if you look, uh, when they go into Carrefour de l'Arbre, right? Uh, surprisingly, so there were seven guys left and Van, Van der Poel knew that Van Aert was sticking to his wheel. So they, they went into Carrefour de l'Arbre sixth and seventh. So Van der Poel went, went to the back on purpose with his intention to, at some point, going to the front and kind of losing Van Aert through those six or seven guys. Um, and turns out, turns out that he was, you know, he was hindered himself and, and couldn't, couldn't do it. But all these little things, I agree, you know, they, they need to look for little tricks to drop each other. Um, and since they can't do it on raw power, they need to take advantage of the situation and and, you know, riding through the group and, and trying to get ahead, uh, even if it's two or three bike lengths, it can be enough. And poor, 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 <laughs> poor Dagan Cole on the cap for later. He was having, he was on the race of his life, not his life, because he has won Roubaix before and he's won the stage of the Tour de France in Roubaix. Obviously, one of the most experienced Roubaix riders out there. I think he was on an amazing day mm -hmm. and he was just, he just didn't like the position of being in second there. I think he was going to get let a little gap go, go be in second or third just to, get a bit more draft behind the wheel because you can still react to different moves in third or fourth wheel. And the poor guy just got pinched. I don't really think it was anybody's fault. I mean, they were well, both uh, kind of he, getting squeezed. He, he does. Uh, yeah. I, I would love to see his poster. I haven't, I haven't read the post race comments, but y you have to imagine he feels like he got. Hey, he, the, the one thing I teach my son and any recreational bikers, if your bars are ahead of the person's okay, bars behind you, you don't have to ask permission, okay? You just go. That's your <laughs> wheel, right? Okay. The person behind you, the person okay. behind you to okay. ask permission or to hit the brakes. Okay, Eddie B. Uh, <laughs> you know, y'all y'all remember, for those longtime cycling fans, there was a very famous, and he's since passed, and may he rest in peace, a famous uh, cycling coach, uh, Eddie Borsavich, otherwise known as Eddie B. Uh, he coached a lot of the greats. You know, the, the Olympic team in 84, he coached Le Mans, he coached us. He had Subaru Montgomery. He had the early, he was the original GM and um, director sportive for the U.S. Postal team. And when I first went to the team, I didn't know anything about cycling. And he had this still, he was from Poland, but he was American or whatever. And he had this really thick Polish accent. And he was like, Lance, if your bars are in front of the other guy, you just move. This is, this is your position. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. Right. What if, what if, what if I'm fucking terrified and the other guy, you know, can ride blindfolded? No, your bars in front <laughs> is your place. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> right. You don't, you don't see anybody in the in the peloton in Belgium or today in uh, northern France when they're a bit at their point thing, like you see here. People, I'm, I'm coming in. I'm coming. No, there's a gap between the wheel in front and the wheel behind. You take it. You don't point, you don't ask, you just don't. And, and the other thing, and, and uh, we're going to take a break here in a second, but the other thing is is what we hear from uh, this Peloton, the guys that we talked to in the Peloton, there's just there's just no more respect or no more honor in this Peloton. They forget what you teach your son or what Eddie B taught us, like that they just, they just go where they want to go. Um, anyways, today's show also brought to you by Ventum. This, this is George. I finally got George converted, got him converted, got him on, I got him on. Uh, the fastest whip out there, the Ventum, the, obviously the GS1, our gravel bikes, the, the brand new NS1, uh, which I have not unpacked. Uh, George, uh, newsflash, George and I uh, are leaving for Tuscany. Uh, when is that, George? Is it uh, Friday? Friday, Friday night? Yep. 
Friday night. Um, on a jizzy. <laughs> But uh, I got, I got. To, I'm gonna take the new NS1 over to Tuscany with George. He's got his new NS1. Uh, gee, how did you like it over there when you were, uh, uh, you know, over there for Flanders riding on the cobbles? And I had a conversation with Dia about it a couple of days ago. I was very, very impressed with the NS1. Good. Um, and it was, a, it was not an easy day, right? You on it was raining. It was sort of the most extreme conditions you can have for cobblestones, and I just loved the feeling of the bike. Um, I felt super stable on the cobbles. And then once you get off the cobbles, you know, lots of times you get that sort of mushy feeling because you don't know what pavement you're on and you just kind of takes you a minute to get going. This bike got you reacted super quick. Um, I loved it. I was really impressed with it. Not going to lie. We'll be sure to send a bunch of pics or post up a bunch of pics of our trip. I think we're over there for four or five days. Uh, we got, of course, our good friend Craig Lewis coming, our other great friend Mark Holowesco. So we'll be riding around Tuscan. Any of you uh, Tuscanites out there, keep an eye out for us and we'll be on our NS1s. Uh, but by the way, the brand is is just completely kicking ass. They're selling a ton of bikes, dedicated customer support. Uh, they're producing great content. Check out their socials at Ventum Racing. That's both on Instagram and YouTube. And special offer, uh, 10% off when you use the code WEDO at checkout at VentumRacing.com slash the move. One final note, we had a, also had a Ventum giveaway at, the, at George's Flanders trip. Uh, Kevin Wilson from Franklin, Tennessee, right around the corner from you, George. Right, he won well, the contest. I'll, I'll ask. I'll, I'll add one more about yeah. Ventum. They are uh, uh, big supporters of our Operation Get Out crew. Right, people exactly. riding bikes for the first time for mental health, and they're going to be in Chattanooga at George's event just a couple weeks away. They've been training. Uh, yeah, I, you've probably seen it on our socials, but they're all on GS ones and loving it. Great. All right, last one of the day. Exciting news: We have a new sponsor of our show today, and it is Caldera Lab. Say goodbye to the generic face wash on your counter because Caldera Lab is here to save the day when it comes to save your skin. Backed by a leading, and check this out, this is, this is no shit, backed by a leading clinical trial where 9 out of 10 men experienced healthier and visibly improved skin. Now, again, I'm going to deviate a little bit because as is the case with most of these uh, partners of ours, they give George the stuff first. I'm always the last to get it. They give it the, to the guy that A, everybody likes, B, looks, a, looks better than all of us. And, and George, you've been on the Caldera Lab for a, a, a while, not just, you know. Y'all, y'all, yeah. y'all don't notice Look, the shine? And, and well, shine. I, 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 we give it a little description because some folks are just listening and not watching. But So, uh, yeah, I, I actually you have. Look, I, you do look a lot younger. I you know? feel it. I feel it. And, and you know what? Um, ironically, Right before we went to Flanders, uh, we always we we only pitch products on this show that we believe in that we want to use. That's for sure. And and we're always talking about we we love new partnerships. We we really appreciate our existing partnerships. But coincidentally, I happened to send Lars, our head of partnerships, a text message a couple weeks ago. I said, "Hey, we should really talk to Caldera Labs because I've been a customer of theirs for years." There you and go. Thought, this would be the perfect product for, uh, you know, Lance is a bit older than me and clearly needs it more than me, the face cream. <laughs> and uh, he said, bro, they're sponsoring, Rube- they're partners of us for the Rubé show. So it's just, I had no idea. And I've been a customer of theirs for a couple of years now. Um, and funny enough, like you said, I got a box from them. I go, did I get dinged on my credit card, credit card twice? Because I just bought it. I just purchased <laughs> it a few weeks ago. Yeah. But it was from, you know, unknowingly from me and them that uh, they're sponsoring the show. So it was just uh, really, ex- for me personally, very excited to have them on board. So they've got this, the, 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 it's called the Regimen. Uh, it's a twice a day routine. And, and the three products are the Clean Slate, the Base Layer, and the Good. And, and the la- uh, not the last thing, but one thing I'll add is, y- y'all, all, I mean, George uh, loves a lot of things, but he loves free shit more than anything. Um, <laughs> and, but it's true. You know, I look at myself, uh, no, that, that is true. But what else is true is like, I look at myself and I'm like, there are times I'm like, I don't sit around and look in the mirror. I really don't care that much, but there are moments where you catch it and you're like, God damn, like, what? I'm getting JV. Yes, yeah, JV. Oh man. He was like looking like, what are these? You know, they used to be called the 11s. Now they're the one elevens. Now they're the 1011s. And then you're like around the mouth. You're like, but if you think about it, like we have pushed ourselves, not just uh, as athletes, but we pushed ourselves in the elements for the same for you, Johan. I mean, outdoors, extreme conditions. We saw it today. What the fuck? I mean, that's that's what happens. But the, now we have an answer. And even better, it's clinically proven. All right. So here's the deal. 
head on over to Caldera Lab. Again, that's C-A-L-D-E-R-A-L-A-B.com slash the move and use the code the move for 20% off. Next thing you know, we're going to be doing shows. We're going to be like, they, people are going to think we put a filter on it. <laughs> and I, I, I just to wrap it up and we got to get back to Roubaix, but I, have a, yeah. I do have a funny story. The Good, which is their oil product, which I use all the time. I brought it to Belgium and I'm putting it on right before we were going out to dinner and I left it on the counter. I forgot to, to screw the top, the top uh, cap back on. So what happens? Clumsy me. I drop it all over the bathroom floor. My brand new The Good product. So I'm on the floor trying to scoop it back up. Back to boy. No, my product. I, I was, I, I'm, well, that was after. That's, that's not happy about that. Probably 12 glasses of red wine. And they, you know, Before that, actually. It would, it, you know, just trying to scoop it up is better than like putting your actual face on the ground, trying to rub your face on it. All right, let's go back to bike racing. Hey, you know what? I, I have a question. Sorry, yeah, I do have a question. Uh, you know, Johan talked about his concern for Vanderpool. Um, exerting so much energy. He was on the attack. Do you think that, all of you, do you think that Vanderpool knows his big competitor is Wow Van Art, right? He knows that if I go on the attack, the attack they're all just going to stare at Van Art. So he has to do the a similar effort to what I just did to, to, mm-hmm. bridge, to, bring, it, to bring it back. And he, had, and, and he had a teammate with Van Art. Right. And it's like he knows he's spending energy, but his big competitor is going right. to be the one. No one else is going to take and up he, that look, chase. He knows. He saw that Ghana was was on the limit. He saw that Peterson was on the limit. So you're going to leave your main rival behind with a teammate with two guys that are on the limit. And aren't, you know, they might want to help, but they just cannot help. So yeah, yeah. Clearly, clearly they're on the offens- offensive. But the biggest difference for me is how well they're, they got their nutrition dialed. Because back in the day, those efforts you're doing, you go, shit, this is, this, if I keep doing this, I'm bonking 100% with 10, yeah. 15K to go. And when you bonk in Roubaix, it's over. Seeing the yeah. douches, there's no coming back. There is no fear of that anymore. If they're, if, they, if they're on a good day, they know they're on a good day, they really have no fear about running out of energy because they're, they're consuming so much fuel in exact amounts and exact times that they're sure that if they're having a good day, they're not even worried about the bonk. Did, did you see, he, he, Vanderpool pulled a gel 10K to go. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look at ten kilometers to go, and maybe he was starting to. You know, sometimes you start to feel like, uh oh, fuel gauge is getting low. I mean, you don't really need to pull a gel ten k to go, and but he did. Um, but that you're right, George. They have it so completely dialed. Well, and you did see him go wrong bottle like a cup at least once, right? It's like I, I saw that, that right. Was, that was Van Art. Van Art. That was Van Art. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, they um, do. I mean, you know, at some point, you know, they, they have so much stuff. So they can basically take bottles all the time, uh, and you know it's it's impossible to know if it's water or you know whatever whatever they want that need at that moment, right? So, um, I, I think I think in 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 terms of the Van Aert uh, Van der Poel rivalry, um, you know you could say okay, you know we're, we're, Van Aert could, Van der Poel could have said okay, you know I'm going to stay here. I have Philipson here, but he knows that his best chances to win are ultimately get away with Van Aert because if they stay mm-hmm. the seven riders th- together, then you have Kung, you have Peterson, you have Ghana who can attack. Uh, and, you know, even if they're out of, uh, you know, if, if, the, if Van Aert and Van der Poel are supervising each other so much, that actually decreases their chances. So Van der Poel, I was a bit, I mean, I was a bit surprised that Van Aert didn't attack. And I, I think I said on the, on the chat, I said, I'm just waiting for an explosion of Van Aert and, and, and next thing he, he attacked. You know, he did one impressive attack and only, only Van der Poel could follow. So, you know, even, I mean, I, I think it's so much more impressive to see this in Paris-Roubaix because in the Tour of Flanders, you could say, okay, you know, we have those three big riders in front. It's cobbles and it's uphill. That's logical. But to ride somebody off the wheel in Paris-Roubaix, George, you know, you, you've done so, done so many times. That's not easy, even if they're super tired. Mm-hmm. Um, so it shows the, how much better those guys really are, right, than the rest. Yeah, uh, that's, that's been clear for the last few years. By the way, yeah. think about uh, Vanderpool, the last few months he's had cyclocross world champion, Milan San Remo champion, yeah. Perry Roubaix yeah. champion. In- I mean, interesting stat here uh, of, of Vanderpool. So he's he started in, in 14 times in a monument, 14 times. 13 times of those 14, he finished top 10. And he won four of them. I mean, there's. Percentage-wise, right now, there is nobody in history who has done better than Mathieu van der Poel 
in uh, in monuments. That's including Eddie Merckx. You know, of, of course, you know the, it's 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 a lot less <clears throat> races, right? But I mean, you know, being world champion, winning Milan San Remo, uh, winning Paris Roubaix, and now what's even more surprising is, and I think I think it's the right decision for him, being Dutch, being the ex-winner of Amstel Gold Race, he's deciding not to participate. In I, I think that's right. I yeah. think. Look, he, he, that performance he had a few years ago, which for me was one of the most mind-blowing physical performances, toughest performances I have ever seen. As far as I'm concerned, he should just drop the mic there. I mean, I don't, uh, yeah, he's like, again, cyclocross world champion, winner of Milan San Remo, winner of Perry Bay. Yeah. I think mm. that's okay. It does seem like this generation, they're checking boxes more than wanting the repeat. Mm. Right. Um, yeah, I would, I, I would guess he's coming back to Rebay though. That's just uh, a yeah. box that you want to keep getting and getting. <laughs> right. Of course, but but you know we're talking so much about Van Aert, Van der Poel, Van der Poel, Van Aert. You know, but if you look, I mean, but they both won Milan San Remo, right? But Van Aert, Van der Poel won already two times the Tour of Flanders, and he was two times second, and now he won Paris Roubaix. Walt Van Aert has not won either of them. You know, mm. so that kind of says to me a little bit that. In my opinion, uh, Mathieu van der Poel is born a bigger talent. He's more of a winner, more of a killer. Oh, no, no. This is doing... Oh, this is that, 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 that's you my opinion. Stop. You have to stop. <laughs> did, you <not> watch, <laughs> did you not watch the Tour de France the last couple of years? My <laughs> Yo, Johan, Johan. Ask the belief. Ask the belief. Ask the belief. No. Don't. And, and, I'm sticking yes, to my guns. That just rust. You guys don't let me finish my sentence. <laughs> no, because you... St sentence. Oh, okay, all right. Time out. Go ahead. Okay. So, oh. so Van Aert, Van der Poel is born with more talent. He's a more, more of a winner. Van Aert is at the same level, but he's a worker. He's working with a system and he's gotten there by working hard and, and, and getting to that level. And he's always, always consistent. But if you, if you ask me if there's a little tiny difference between those two, is that Mathieu Van der Poel is more of a winner than Walt Van Aert. Look, the, the only difference today that we mm. we can we cannot okay. dispute wow. the difference today was that Wild Van Aert flatted with ten kilometers to go. Other than that, yeah, Vanderpool might have been attacking a bit more. I feel like when Van Aert was riding a bit smarter race, was waiting for his teammates. Did it? Nobody really needed to get more than a minute gap. There was no reason to to pull more than the other in that breakaway. And by the way, that the breakaway of you know Van Aert, Vanderpool, Mads Peterson, Stefan Kung, uh, Dagen Kolb. I was watching the race with Bobby Julek, 234 wins combined. This was the I iconic uh, breakaway of, of the classic season. These are the best of the best. This is yeah. no panic cook and breakaway. They got there for a reason. They were all on great days. Ghana was there as well. Can't leave him out. But when Art went on the Cafe de Lab, when we knew that that was the time to go, and they went together, I don't feel like there was a difference in level. No, um, I, 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 I think it's the choice of words when, when uh, Johan says winner. That's what stings. But what I think you're conveying is, is like Vanderpool is, <laughs> no, he's just, Vanderpool's just got more of a killer instinct. Like uh, uh, kind of how we describe Ro Roglic. Is Roglic uh, as talented as some of them, but he's got that killer mentality. Well, Roglic is not as talented as the others, but he's, he's Y'all, y'all forget tough. too quick. There, Listen, no, 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 no. Didn't we have a show in July and all we talked about was Van Aert? Uh, did well, we mention it, Vanderpool you know, at all during the tour? You know what, not you, guys also <laughs> forget? Listen, what you guys also forget? We're talking about all these guys. I, I really want to point out one rider that we haven't talked about, Jasper Philipsen. Yeah. You know, a part of a part of being there for his for his teammate, but being second. But Jasper Philipsen today has showed that he is a lot more than a, than one of the three best sprinters in the world. You know, if you could, if you look at Guys like Caleb Ewan, uh, Bruno Wegen, uh, Jakobsen, Philipsen, he beats all those guys. And he is a damn good, I mean, he's second in Paris Roubaix, not sitting on the wheels, working, working very, very hard. And so I think for the future, uh, a, a rider like Philipsen can win Paris Roubaix, can win Tour of Flanders, can win Gand Wevelgem, and win stages in the Tour in Bunch Prints, you know? I mean, it's, it's a bit of a throwback. We, we in our generation, you had some good sprinters that could ride at the front of Roubaix. Maybe not win, but they could certainly be in the, in the, in the final selection. But I just want to go back. The, the, this, because I want to, uh, I think it's important, and George, you said it, like, we don't know, you know, the guy flatted, Wild Fenner yeah. flatted, right? And, and, uh, and, and his whole team flatted. So it, it's, 
I, 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 I don't, I disagree with you on, and I agree, also agree with George that in three weeks, we're going to probably be having the exact opposite conversation. Not only that, he, he flatted and he had a, a mechanic or a swan yard on the side of the road, had to manually change the tire. It took about roughly 30 seconds. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. He kept that same exact gap, essentially doing all the work. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the second group, going straight to the front, attacking them, riding, doing the blunt of the work. Didn't lose any time to Vanderpool until the end, obviously, when the sprint came along and then they lost a few more seconds. But, I mean, he, he didn't get, end up going any slower. I feel like the level was exactly the same. And if we saw what happened in E3 prize where he pumped them in the sprint, I think he would have won Paris Roubaix today without that flat. Okay. George, you know, you know more than anybody else. In Paris Roubaix, the winner is always right. Yeah, correct, correct. <laughs> no, I mean, look, it, it's it's it is a very technical race in the sense, and I, and I do want to wrap up the show talk because we talked about on the pre-show about uh, tire selection, tire pressure, width of tires, and how much that has changed, but. Dude, look at the, and especially when they're jumping from the sides back to the stones and then over to the sides. I, I know I had that in my final Tour de France when we had the Paris based or the, you know, cobbled stage. I thought it'd get cute, go over to the side. Then you jump back on the rocks. And, and when you jump over, they have these little, these little borders and they're sharp, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it, the mechanicals happen, flats happen, crashes happen. It's a, it's a, it, it is a weird, like if, if, look, if the average person sat down right in the middle of the force of Amberg, like they'd mm -hmm. never watched, like they'd watched like three bike races. And let's hope it wasn't the NCL race yesterday, okay? Because they would never watch cycling ever again. But it, 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 if just, you know, Common Joe sat down, they would be like, what are these guys doing? Mm. Like, you wouldn't believe it. it, it, is, it it's extreme. Yeah, it's you, extreme. Can, you cannot have any, any real appreciation by watching it on TV or even seeing pictures. You have to see it for yourself and, and, and see, wow, this is, it's impossible to ride a bike over there. And yet these guys are doing it, you know, so. Um, and so, and so on the tires, let's talk about it. Cause this is, in, and then we'll wrap up that, but this is, you know, the, obviously technology evolves uh, as much as the UCI allows it to. Uh, I think it'd be fun to just have a quick chat on, on sort of the, the, what tires were like, George, in your, in your prime with the width of them, what kind of tires they were. All of this has changed, right? We went from sew ups or, or, uh, whatever to now tubeless, uh, to, to wider tires. And I mean, the, just to hear the differences pretty, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we had, we had tires that were aged in our mechanics, head mechanics wine cellar for, for years before he would, he would bust them out for Flanders and Roubaix, but I believe there were 25s. They weren't much bigger than 25s or 27s. Correct me if I'm wrong, Yolan. I but going back, think, I personally think at some point we had 20, Flanders, definitely 25. Roubaix, maybe some, some, because that was another thing back in the days. We didn't have for, we didn't have availability for the whole team. It was just for, you know, for the leaders and their spare bikes. And the rest was just on, on 25 tires. So, so going back to the, the, the mechanics, the head, the, the, the performance staff, all the Jumbo Visma team tonight is going to be scratching their heads going, what happened? Because the flat here and there, okay, it's Paris Roubaix, that's going to happen. But the flats that they had today. That was right. way too many, in my opinion, right. and it, it affected too much of their overall race. The, something is going to happen. They're going to really dive into what went wrong with their setup today. Because you know, I, can, I can't. I, let's just say, I, can, I, I go ahead. No, go, JB. You, I can't. I, I, I can't let, let that. You go past that aging the tires in the basement. Like yeah. you've got, you've got to elaborate more on that. Of what I, I, I logic and I, I, you can <laughs> ask that. I, I, did I did I say there was logic and reason? I had no <laughs> idea. I just know he did it. No, and I think that what was the theory? What was the very, theory behind? I'm very proud of it. I don't. I, have no well, idea I, I think it got a little embellished over time. No, but it was it was <laughs> true back in the days. Back in the days, new tires which were not mature enough, like the 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 rubber was too fresh, and you had more punctures. But that was when it was tubular tires, right? So so basically, the whole thing was stuck on, glued on the on the rim. You know, okay. but if coming back to Jumbo Visma, George, you know, let, uh, you know, this year they were talking about this new system, right? Where you can regulate the tire pressure. There was three riders who were riding it. Van Aert and Laporte chose not to. Uh, but let's not forget last year in Roubaix, I still have the, the images. Both Laporte and Walt Van Aert had flat tires and they kept riding on their, uh, on, on their wheels and they broke their wheels, both of them, right. like in the middle. So... I think personally, there's something there that they're either they're experimenting too much the day of the race, 
Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's two years in a row where they have really, I mean, and 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 actually, the two these two main riders have problems with their equipment. Yeah, race, and, race deciding, race deciding, uh, yeah. you know, punctures. And and just so we're in, and, and we got, you know, of course, had some folks there uh, sort of walking the pits. Uh, if George said, you know, most of the time you rode Roubaix in Flanders with 25 mil tires, looked like almost the entire Peloton was on 32s. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're talking a 25% wider tire right? and a completely different tire. I mean, a whole different technology and, and um, boy, m- certainly makes the ride a lot better. Hey, I got to bring up one more thing uh, that uh, if, for those of you watching it on YouTube or Facebook, you can see this and and all the photos that are going to be on socials at the finish is going to be very confusing and one of the most unique finishes you've ever seen mm. because you see Vanderpool finishing in uh, Van Art and uh, and uh, uh, Philipson behind them and you think that was the finish first, second, third, right there. Go into detail on that. That was, for those who didn't watch it, it was actually, there was a lap in between them. Uh, yeah, but just well, one of the most bizarre finish photos in history. Well, I think, you know, Just also a very unique finish because Parido Bear finishes on a velodrome. So Van der Poel already crossed the finish when Van Aert and, and Philipsen still needed to do one lap. And so you see this this picture behind me, which I agree, it looks like it looks like the three guys, the three guys finished together, but actually... It was it was incredible to see that Philipson was already celebrating, and he still needed to do his sprint for second, which ultimately he also won. But uh, oh yeah, was, yeah, yeah that's interesting. Okay, so this is an actual photo. I, yeah, I, just, yeah, I, yeah, thought, yeah. I thought you cut and pasted. I thought no, this that, that this is what happens when you have an iPad on your lap and you're watching the Masters on the big screen, <laughs> <laughs> things like that, Lance. So you know maybe you could have fit pause on the Masters for a second to watch the finish of Roubaix. You think? Yeah. Now that this is the this is the actual finish finish picture of uh, Van der Poel and and Van Aert and Philips still need to do one lap and I mean, what a day for that team, right? That, uh, that is, you know, that that okay, that that makes sense. Yeah, that is a no. cool photo. Then I thought you cut and pasted like it. No, that was, I'm not. I'm not that. Uh, that's the photo. Well, that's the photo. Good man. <laughs> and, and and think about it, he's going for his. Okay, he's won a ton of races, but his biggest result in a one day iconic, you, you know, monument. And he's raising his hands right about 350 meters before his, he actually has to sprint. You'd think okay. he'd be more focused oh, wow. on the task at hand. Exactly. He, yeah, that's how happy he was for the result. Okay, so, all right, all right, just to wrap it up, and our final question, and it's a question for uh, uh, George and Johan. In lieu of uh, Wild Van Aert's, you know, the Flanders and today, uh, is there regret, and this is the end of the cobbled classics for this season, is there regret about giving up Gen Wevelgem to his teammate? In my opinion, no. Mm. No, yeah, I, I say no. No, I think I think Van Aert is at that level, you know, where he he is. Listen, he is one of the three best riders in the world. What is one or two or three times Gant Bevelgem is gonna? He already won Gant Bevelgem, right? He what what, do, what he wants to win is Tour of Flanders and Tour. You're, you're treading on, care, on, on on sensitive territory here. You know, we have a Gant Bevelgem winner here with us. So no, don't, no, don't, shit, I, don't, I, no, don't 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 call it. A, I'm sorry. If you start to call it a Panacooka race or whatever you're about to I, say, I, just I stop. I, I would I would trade I, think I would trade ten ten or five uh, when Ken Bovegans for one Roubaix or one Tour of Flanders. No doubt. That, I yeah, agree with that. Yeah. 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 No, I think I think uh, it it shows how the team is working together and what kind of relationship they have. I mean, from what I understand also they did they spent so much time together on altitude camps preparing for the classics. And um yeah, I mean Laporte is I mean, listen, today if w- without without that puncture we would probably be telling a different story because Agreed. Laporte would have buried himself for one hour today. Uh, 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 that is the exact opposite of what you said 10 minutes ago, but okay. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I do have I do have uh, just some housekeeping here. So next time we're all together is for... Uh, hey, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still gold race. No, I I'm thought still. I had something next week. I'm still gold race. Uh, we uh, well, we're doing uh, the uh, women's Perry Robay was delayed. We're doing that tomorrow. Don't we have that? Flesh- maybe in what? Don't we have Flesh Wallone on the nineteenth? Oh, oh, we have Amstel Gold on Amstel that. before that. Okay, all right. So so we're all together for Amstel Gold, and then we'll do Flesh Wallone, and then but JB, you and I can talk off one. I've got a, a, a technical question because we'll be over. George and I are going to be in Tuscany. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> 
I finally, you know, it's fun. I finally, you know, fucking George, he goes on all these, you know, uh, fancy trips with fancy people and jets and all over the world and resorts and, and, uh, and done. <laughs> and I finally get to go on one. This is my first one. <laughs> first, first time. I mean, listen, oh my God. listen, y'all all tuned in and we appreciate it. I mean, that's fun. You know, like, oh, LA's playing a little offense. I mean, if this is not an indication that LA's back, <laughs> fucking got invited on a VIP trip with George. George, George already. Really? True, true story is that he actually responded to a text message for one time. And, you know, <laughs> a few <laughs> times. Also, I read how to do this kind of uh, setup because we, we did it together in, in Flanders. Um, George and I, uh, you know, Lance, when you were not on the show. And by the way, lots, lots of people have sent messages. That was ri really one of the best shows ever. Sorry, just throwing that in there. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but George, George, <laughs> George knows how to do this. Um, so, so, um, you know, and I just showed up and talked. I had no idea how to set it up. But I'm good. You know what? The listener doesn't need to hear how we're going to yeah. technically pull off a podcast in Tuscany. Just, uh, just, good. just be on a couch JB, together. JB, I'll call you later today. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I'll call you when the Masters is over. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.